They say war never changes. But then again, I don't think they've ever met a seven foot tall super mutant. Welcome to the castle, everybody. This is Nightsaber Z42, and today I will be reviewing Fallout the TTRPG by Modifius Games. Let's dive in. Here we have Fallout, the role-playing game book. This was published by Modifius in the summer of 2021. And let's take a look at this inside cover for a moment because... <laughs> so most RPG books that you're going to find have a just a plain colored inside cover. And it's so bland. A lot of OSR products out there nowadays actually fill this space with relevant information you know, things that the players might need to know or the game master might need to know like right off the bat. But here we actually have something that's iconic to the Fallout universe and that's the please stand by screen. Uh, and it's on the inside, both the front and the back. And we do have a nice book mark ribbon. Products that do this are, they, they really get a thumbs up for me because my gosh, like all the times that I've had to flip through pages when I could have just actually used the bookmark. So kudos to Modifius for doing that. So the table of contents, we have 12 chapters including the appendices and this was designed by Nathan Dowdell and Sam Webb and I believe all of the artwork is provided by Bethesda? Don't quote me on that, but it does say Bethesda artwork and staff, and there's a whole list of names, and it, it does look very pretty. Like, when I first opened this book up in my little brief run-through with it a couple weeks ago, I made a comment about the pages and how glossy they were, and kind of how thin they felt because of the glossiness, and, you know, now that I've actually spent some time with this book, I, I would very much like to retract that because, my gosh... This artwork on these pages, it looks so beautiful. And, ha, man, I am, like, super stoked about this book. So we're going to get started with the introduction. So there is another comment that I would like to make on this or at least within these uh, first couple chapters, and that's the art spread. Not only is it, like, super amazing, but the actual chapters with the actual sections that you're going to need are right there on the front. That's thinking ahead, and I really do like that. I appreciate that. So this is the first chapter, and this is actually chapter zero, which kudos to them for naming it that, because really, who needs an introduction chapter? And this is kind of basically what you're going to find in a typical RPG. It's uh, what's in this book, um, how do you play it, who are the player characters, who's the game master, how does it kind of function a little bit. Um, there is one, uh, there's actually two things that are kind of a little bit different that you will need to know for this one. The first one concerns the dice. So if you've never played a 2d20 game, it's a little bit different. So instead of having one d20, you're actually going to use two or at least a base of two. You can actually get more, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And I'm actually using the official Fallout dice that you can actually buy from or buy with the book. Um, as I believe it's called the Player's Bundle on Modifius, and I actually did pre-order that too. It actually comes with three D20s, one of which is specifically body parts, and we'll talk about that when we get into combat. And then there's four different or there's actually four D6s which have different um, uh, facings. So there's a hit, there's a two hits, and then two of the faces have the little fallout dude, and those are going to be effects. And we'll talk about that later. But dice are a little bit different because the facings on the D6s are totally different. You're also going to probably need some poker chips to keep track of action points. And yes, there are action points. And... Possibly bats. So let's get into chapter one, the core rules. You're gonna hear me say this like many, many times and I'm sorry. So how about I just say it like at least 11 more times or at least we'll just put this one with the times 11. 
the art in this book is just gorgeous and it absolutely looks beautiful on these pages. Okay, that's it. Just just play this back like 11 more times, one for each of the chapters and we'll, we'll be good. So this is actually relevant for both players and GMs. And if you've never played a D or 2D20 game, uh, this is going to kind of be a little bit new. So if you're coming from this from like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, similar concepts, it's just the way that you get there is a little bit different. So if you've never actually played a 2D20 game, here's, here's how it goes. You're asked to make a roll, and you're going to roll with an attribute plus a skill. And this is actually going to be your, your target number. So you add those two together, and that becomes your target number. Sometimes the difficulty will be more, so you might have to succeed more than once. And what you'll do is you'll actually roll 2D20, and you can actually buy more d20s by spending action points and so you'll roll those and if it rolls at or under your attribute plus skill for that test you succeed you can score critical hits which are which are determined on whether you roll within the range of your skill and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later too let's do a quick example let's say i'm going to shoot somebody using agility with a small gun so i would take my agility score which we'll say is five and then we'll take my small guns which we'll say is rank three so add those two together and we get eight that means i need to roll eight or under to actually succeed and i would roll my 2d20s and if i actually roll let's see if my small gun ranks is three if i roll three or under i gain a critical success that will count as two successes instead of one so it's a way of actually getting more successes with minimum die as well, but you're probably going to want to opt in to buy more dice with the action, uh, the action points. If you roll a natural 20, however, like I did before, actually I rolled a 1, um, 20 is actually a 20, but if you roll a natural 20, the GM actually introduces a complication, um, just something on the spur of the moment that's going to really hinder your character in some way. And you kind of work together with the GM to figure out what that's going to be, so long as it fits within the narrative. You always roll 2d20 by default, but you can buy more. And I believe the actual, the actual action point cost is on a nice handy dandy chart on page 18. So 2d20 is going to be 0 AP because that's your default. But I can opt in to buy one extra d20 for one action point, two for three points, and then spend all of my action points, which the max you can have is six, and you'll spend all of that to get three d20s. That means at most I can ever have five, I can only roll five d20s. Um, this goes for the GM and for the players. And yes, you did hear me right, the GM actually gets their own supply of action points that's not part of the players. So they can actually use that to screw you up too. If a task is too easy, the PC or player characters can automatically succeed at that task, or they can roll. Now, if you choose to roll, um, any successes you get will actually increase your action points. So if I'm at one action point and I get two successes, that means I now have three action points. Likewise, if we roll a natural 20, the GM is going to add some complications. So be aware of that. Every time you roll, there is the possibility of ha something just coming up and hindering your characters. There are rules for opposed tests, and they're kind of a little confusing, um, at least when you have player versus player. When it's GM versus player, things are a little bit straightforward, but when you have player versus player, it it's really confusing because you both share the same action point pool and so there's something about like one of the one of the characters gives the GM action points so they can buy more dice or something like that and it's, it's it was needlessly confusing and I don't really agree with it in a way so there is that I would probably just say you just straight up roll 2d20 in my games but yeah we also have luck. Luck is a resource that is, of course, dependent on your character's luck score, which is actually one of their attributes. And a player can spend their luck finding, let's say, like extra things 
when they're scavenging around the wasteland, they can spend a luck point to use their luck attribute instead of uh, the default attribute when they are determining the target number for a test. So like, let's say I, I don't want to use my small gun skill. I'd rather use my luck. I can spend a luck point to say, use that luck skill for the target number basically. You can even spend a luck point to interrupt anyone in combat. So like after, let's say, after a character takes their turn, it's not your turn, but I can spend a luck point, so now it becomes my turn. The biggest benefit to luck, however, is the ability to re-roll a die during a test. So misfortune, it says right here, re-roll 1d20 or three of these uh, action dice per luck point spent. So if you roll pretty bad, you can, of course, re-roll. Now, luck is a resource, which means you spend it, and yeah, you can get down to zero luck, which would be pretty bad in some cases, but you can also regain your luck by either the good graciousness of the GM or when you reach a milestone in your quest. Of course, when you go into a new quest, you also reset to your luck score. Um... I'm actually going to point something out right here as we flip through the actual first chapter of this book. Um, something that I really noticed, at least while reading this book, is just how clear and concise everything is written. And just appreciating the fact that everything is really well organized. Like you're going to have a topic and there's a lot of bullet points spread out throughout this book that cover those topics and I really do appreciate just how easy it was to read this. It really makes things nice, especially for new people who are new to this game or system. So let's talk about combat. So I'm actually really surprised that the section or the chapter of combat is actually before character creation. Usually character creation is one of, like, if not the first chapter, it comes very close to being at the very beginning of the book. But here we get core rules all the way. And I do consider combat to be part of the core rules because these are mechanics that are going to serve you for basically the main part of the game. When combat starts, the character who initiated it gets a single turn, or rather, I think it's a single action, to do whatever they want. This is kind of like, you know, you're in the game and you crouch down behind the NPC and then you initiate bats and you target their head like a bajillion times and then pull the trigger. That's kind of like what this is. Initiative is actually static. It's a stat. It's a stat that is, it stays the same all the way. So this means that all characters have an initiative score. I like this because it makes initiative, like the whole concept, quick and easy. Now we don't have to have everybody roll for initiative and determine who's going when and where. Like, if you've played with their group enough times, you know that Jimmy over there is going before Sally. The only thing that really changes are the NPCs who might actually go before some of the characters. So. There is that. There are two different types of actions, major actions and minor actions. If you've played any RPG, this is kind of your standard run-of-the-mill stuff. So some of your minor actions will be things like aiming, you can draw an item, interact with an object, move, or take a chem. Some of the major actions include assisting another character on their next test, attacking, you can command an NPC to do something for you, defend, apply first aid, you can do nothing, although who really does that? You can rally, ready, sprint, or make a, some sort of a test. So you're doing something. Of course, we have action points, which means that we are going to be able to use our those points in, or in combat. So I can, of course, buy some D20s for a test, like normal. I can spend an action point to gain information from the Game Master, so basically ask the Game Master a single question about the current situation based on your test. The GM will answer truthfully, but the answer might not be complete. You can take an additional minor action for one action point, or take an additional major action for two action points, but you can only take 
a total of two minor actions in a single round or two major actions in a single round. Yeah, you don't get to spend all of that stuff and act like four times like I know some fighters in Dungeons and Dragons can do. Sorry, it's not that type of game. Additionally, you can spend one to three action points to add extra damage on melee or thrown weapons. For ranged weapons, it's a little bit different, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So to attack with a weapon, well, first we got to choose a weapon, because you might have more than one. So after you choose a weapon and a target and a body part, yeah, you heard me right, you get to target a body part, or not. You could leave it up to chance with this handy-dandy D20, but, you know, let's just say I'm going to aim for that uh, leg of there so they can't escape. So if you decide to aim or target at a body part, you will increase the target number or the difficulty to hit by one. If you're using a melee weapon, you are going to use strength plus melee weapons as your skill. For ranged weapons, if you're using small guns, you're going to use agility plus small guns. For big guns, it's endurance plus big guns. And for energy weapons, it's perception plus energy weapons. Now. This is my personal preference or personal opinion, but I really never saw why that perception is the energy weapons ability. If perception wasn't it for all the others, but only one, I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense to me, but oh well, it's not my game. If you're using a thrown weapon, you're going to use perception plus explosives or agility plus throwing. And for unarmed, you're going to use strength plus unarmed. The target number for these tests is always going to be the target's defense score. So all NPCs and characters have a defense score to hit that determines how many successes you need in order to deal damage. So like I said before, if you didn't choose a body part and you score a hit, you're going to roll a 1d20 to decide what body part that is. And then damage is determined by rolling the combat dice. So you're gonna take however many d6s is indicated on your weapon, roll those. For each of these little bullet holes will be one success, there's two successes, and for each head is going to be one success and an extra effect. So some of your weapons will need to generate some of these effects in order to make use of their effects. Just remember, if you're using melee or thrown weapons, you could always spend an action point to deal at least one more damage. Alternatively, at least for ranged weapons, you can spend a unit of ammunition to add plus one die to the dice pool. That's right, you're going to have to keep track of your ammo too. Range is also taken into consideration, and I do like that this is abstract in a way, just kind of like Star Wars FFG. You're going to have close range, medium range, long range, and extreme range. So if, you, if you've played Star Wars FFG before, this is nothing new. It, the only thing that is new and I kind of disagree with is that if, oh, if you're firing a weapon from out of its actual range, whether it's closer or farther, you increase the difficulty to hit by one. So that means if I'm using a gun that is beneficial at long range, even if I shoot it at medium range, I'm going to increase the difficulty by one. I really don't agree with that. Like, it makes sense for sniper rifles, but like if I have a, a combat rifle, I would think that I'd be able to use it at long range and maybe at medium range. Uh, I just don't really agree with that. But at least there is a nice handy dandy chart right here that'll actually say if your range to the target is this and your weapon's range is this, then this is how much you add. So you don't really have to keep that in mind. You could always look at the chart. Critical hits in combat are different from rolling a critical on a test, by the way. Whenever you deal five or more damage in one hit, it is considered a critical hit. Depending on where you hit, there will actually be different results. So for example, arm, if you get a critical hit on an arm, you drop any object held in that hand and the arm is broken or otherwise unable to move. You cannot perform any actions using that arm by itself or alongside your other arm. There's an effect for legs, torso, and the head. And boy, if you get hit, if you get critical in the head, game over, pal. 
There's, of course, rules for dying. So it's actually pretty straightforward here. Uh, you make a roll to save. If you make it, you're still alive. But you remain dying. So that means every turn you're going to have to make another roll. If you fail, you're dead, son. Of course, to survive from dying, it's always going to be endurance plus survival. There's also rules on healing, and it is worth noting that robots actually do heal differently than humans, as they should, because they're mechanical. You don't just put a stim pack in a robot and it is all of a sudden better. There's also, you're also going to be able to treat injuries. There's long-term recovery because recovery is a slow process, which I really do like. I always like that in my RPGs, and it's something that I wish I played with more. There's environment effects, so going across hazardous terrain, there's going to be dangerous objects like mines and stuff like that. There's all sorts of rules, and I really do appreciate that there's pretty much a table for everything. It makes looking up information pretty easy. And something that I'm going to point out here is this is a lot of detail for a game. Just wait till you get later on into the other stuff because it gets even more detailed, which is both good and bad, depending on what kind of a player or GM you are. So let's get into character creation. <laughs> So do you know how I always complain that some books put like all of the steps for character creation at the end of that chapter? Yeah, it's right here at the very beginning. So two thumbs up for Modiphius for doing that. Thank you very much. So let's get to character creation. This is like my favorite part. And if you weren't pumped about playing this game just from the first couple chapters, then character creation is, is going to get you there. When I made my character vault character for, for Fallout... I was just so stoked uh, making my little, uh, what was it, the super mutant uh, basher who just charged into things. Oh, I really enjoyed it. So let's talk about how special you are. Special stands for strength, perception, endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck. So just like in Fallout. In fact, if you've played Fallout games, then this is nothing brand new. It's the same thing. It, they really do encapsulate the flavor of all of the games in this book. So if you are familiar with Fallout in general, you're going to be familiar with most of the concepts in this book. Skills are your specializations. So you have things like athletics, barter, big guns, energy weapons, explosives, lockpick, medicine, melee weapons, pilot, which is new, it was never in a game, but hey, if you want to Mad Max it up, you can. Repair, science, small guns, sneak, speech, survival, throwing, and unarmed. Those are all of your skills, and they do describe them in greater detail what they do, which is always good. You have derived statistics like carry weight, and before we actually move on, something I kind of forgot to go over are tag skills. So just like in the games, you do tag some skills, and they are your basically preferred skills. You're good with those skills. So for here... Um, remember when I rolled that d20 and I said if I rolled three or under with my small guns, that was a critical success or a critical, yeah, a critical success? Well, tag skills make that happen. If I didn't have a skill that was tagged, then I would only get a critical success on a one, which is that symbol right there. But if I have a task skill, then I increase the crit range quite a bit. So you are really going to at least pick up one combat skill as a tag skill. I'm not saying not telling you how to play the game, but I totally would and I totally did with my super mutant. So like I said before, initiative is a static stat. The formula is right there. You want defense. Defense is one if your agility is between one and eight. And if it's it's two if it's nine or higher. You do have damage resistance because you're going to get hit quite a bit. Now the thing about damage resistance is it's actually going to cover your armor. Yeah, we know. Of course it would. But guess what? You actually have not one type of armor. You have multiple types of armor on your body at the same time, depending on where you get hit. So yes, you're going to need to keep track of what armor you're wearing on your arms, 
your legs, head, torso. You're going to need to keep track of all of that. And luckily, the character sheet actually does a really good job of that. So go back to that my previous video on that if you would like to see what that is all about. So what about character creation? First step, choose your origin. There's six different origins to choose from. They serve as your race and your class. So you have the Brotherhood of Steel, Ghoul, Super Mutant, my personal favorite, Mr. Handy, my actual favorite. I mean, look at that. It's a freaking Mr. Handy with like two geese in his in his claws and a rifle. Plus he's got saws. And look at that little hat. Like, I didn't even know they made hats like that. Or little tiny hats like that. Uh, you have Survivor, Vault Dweller. So after you choose your origin, you get to increase your special attributes. Each starts at five, and you have five points to spend. Now you can actually turn one of those fives into a four to gain an extra point. Or you could just do what I did and actually use this uh, standard array for balanced, focused, or specialized. That's the easy way to do it. Now it should be worth noting that you can only decrease once, uh, you decrease a stat by one, you can't decrease it by two, sorry. No min-maxing here, or at least not like that. And an attribute can only go up to 10. Next you're gonna choose a tag skills. You get three tag skills to tag and increase those skills by two ranks each. Then you're going to spend nine plus intelligence score to increase more skills by those ranks. They don't become tag skills though, so be aware of that. Next we get to choose perks, which is actually my personal favorite, and there's actually some interesting ones. And a lot of these come straight from the games themselves, all by with the, uh, you know, pen and paper twist. So you have things like adamantium skeleton. So when you suffer damage, the amount of damage needed to inflict a critical hit on you increases by your rank in this perk. And yes, perks can be upgraded, or rather you can gain ranks in those uh, perks. Another favorite of mine is Black Widow, or Lady Killer. <laughs> so opposite gender, charisma tests, all abound. Bloody mess is always fun, but this one actually does something. <laughs> When you inflict the critical hit, roll one uh, action die. If you roll an effect, you inflict one additional injury to a random location. So it's not just an explosion of a bloody gory mess. You can actually get a dog. Dog meat is the perk you want. Mr. Sandman is always interesting. So when you make a sneak attack with a silenced or suppressed weapon, the damage is increased by two action dice. You cannot gain this benefit while in power armor because power armor doesn't sneak. And Mysterious Stranger, that's always a fun one. Basically, it works just like the game. The GM, you spend a luck point and say, I want Mysterious Stranger to show up and the GM is going to make it happen for you. And if they don't, you get that luck point back. <laughs> and yes, it does say any attempt to find where the stranger went after their attack fails. So, yeah, you're never going to know who the mysterious stranger is. So, huh. There's tons and tons of perks, and I actually do like that. But my only complaint is there's never enough perks. That's why we add mods. So, <laughs> there is that. That's not really a complaint. And then we have our derived stats. So, that's like carry weight, your damage resistance from the armor that you wear, your defense, which was already, which remember is going to be one if it's eight or less agility or two if it's nine or higher. You're gonna figure out your initiative, which is perception plus agility added together. Health points is endurance plus luck. And the amount of damage you do with melee attacks is actually right here. So you're either gonna do one, two, or three damage per hit. So that's it pretty much for character creation. The only other thing is equipment, and it gets its own chapter, but Something that I really do like is that each origin kind of gets their own loadout. So the Brotherhood of Steel actually has the Brotherhood of Steel Initiate or the Brotherhood of Steel Scribe. And they're kind of the same, just a little bit different depending on, you know, background stuff. The only one that is, I would think, drastically different is the Mr. Handy. Because you could be Miss Nanny, Mr. Farmhand, Mr. Gutsy, the original Mr. Handy, or the Nurse Handy. 
Super Mutant has two, Vault Dweller has two, the Wastelander, which is Survivor and the Ghoul. They actually have quite a bit. Mercenary, Raider, Settler, Trader, Wanderer. You can uh, pick a personal trinket from the list. And something that they actually really didn't mention before when it was relevant, uh, you actually get some sort of a item from your tag skills. So let's say that I have a... I tagged big guns. I would get four plus two rolls on the action dice uh, shots of flamer fuel. So I hope you actually manage to buy that flamer fuel or else that's going to be totally useless. You also get starting caps if you're above level one. I mean, caps make the world go round, so who, who am I to complain? So speaking of equipment, let's actually dive right on into it. Imagine, if you will, any weapon from the Fallout universe. There is going to be some form of that weapon represented here in this ginormous chapter. Now, imagine any number of ways you can modify that weapon. That's about how many unique possibilities there are within this chapter alone. This is a really big chapter, and I am so thankful that somebody had the foresight to organize it in the way that they did because it would have made this entire chapter a nightmare if they didn't. There are seven different weapon types. You have big guns, energy, explosives, melee, small guns, throwing, and unarmed. There are eight different damage effects that a weapon could possess. You'll need to actually roll effect on an action dice in order to actually trigger these, and they come in burst, breaking, Persistent, piercing, radioactive, spread, stun, and vicious. So those are effects that you can trigger yourself. And there are four damage types. So you'll have physical energy, radiation, and poison. And that's particularly useful to know because damage resistance is particular to the damage type. So I might have damage resistance on my arm for physical, but not necessarily for radiation or poison. There are also 16 different qualities. For weapons. These are passive abilities and describe how your weapon operates. And they are accurate, blast, close quarters, concealed, debilitating, gatling, inaccurate, mine, night vision, parry, recon, reliable, suppressed, thrown, two-handed, and unreliable. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with these weapons. And we're not even going to touch the ammunition. Well, actually, ammunition is just standard for that particular weapon. So you do need to keep track of your ammunition. The good thing is you can actually find them by scavenging around. And this little table actually says how much you can find and how rare it is. That's good information for your GM, by the way. So with these basic concepts out of the way, we're actually ready to take a look at the weapons. And the very first weapon is actually the syringer, specifically syringer ammo, because it's very much different than your typical bullet. So syringer ammo, or the syringer uses the syringer ammo, and each of the ammo types does something different. For example, berserk. If one or more effects are rolled for the weapon's damage, the target the target becomes frenzied and berserk, attacking the nearest living creature, friend or foe, for the remainder of the scene. Just make sure you back out of the way and make sure you oh, you are not the closest person to that enemy. So they all do something very different, which is actually really cool. I would love to see some builds that utilize that. The only problem is some of the syringer ammos are quite costly, and I would imagine that they are quite rare. One of the things that I am praising this book on is that they actually separated all of the weapons by their type. So you have small guns is one section, big guns in another section, and it's all organized in a very clear-cut way. It's very easy. So you're going to have the general description of the weapons. You're going to have a list. It kind of looks a little bit like 5th edition. And I am so thankful that Modifius did not pull off what 5th edition did with just one ginormous table for everything. That is just a nightmare to read. So you've got the, the name of the weapon, its type, which is going to be small guns, how many dice you roll when you hit, 
any damage effects, the type of damage, how many times you can fire it in a round, and the range that you need to be in to actually use it. Remember, if you're outside of that range, you're going to increase the difficulty by at least one or more. There's qualities, the weight, and how much it costs, and of course, rarity. So something that's really cool is that they give a detailed description of each weapon. Now, you're probably saying, man, look at this table. There's like at least 20 different guns there. You're saying there's a description for each of those? Yes, I am. But it gets even better because part of this description are all of the mods that you can put on that weapon. Yes, there's no complicated chart or anything like that. You want to know what I can put on my 10 millimeter pistol? Well, take a look. You can have these types of receivers, these types of barrels, these types of grips, magazines, sights, muzzles. Those are the mods that you can install on that weapon. And that gets praise from me. Although this doing that actually totally makes this chapter even bigger. But I digress. I'd rather have a big chapter with clear and concise layout than just a jumbled mess. So there is a table that has a list of all of the mods available and what they do because the descriptions doesn't actually say what the mods do. So you will have to consult this chart. And it also tells you what perks you need to actually install that mod. So there's another table for energy weapons and it's pretty much the same from here on out. Although I will say Gamma Gun gets its own mod table. So be aware of that if you happen to find a Gamma Gun. There's another table or another section for big guns. And some of those weapons also have unique mods that only apply to them. Melee weapons, throwing weapons, and explosives. And then we get to apparel, which is your armor. So first off, some armor basics. Armor covers four different locations. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Just kidding. Head, torso, arms, and legs. And for arms, you are going to have a right side and a left side. And legs, you're going to have a left side and a right side. So that actually bumps up the total to six different body parts that you're going to have to keep track of. Wearing armor gives you damage resistance to either one or a combination of the following. Physical energy, radiation, or poison. So you're going to have some damage resistance to at least one of those uh, types. If you hit an enemy, and remember, if you didn't aim for a specific body part, you do roll on the d20 to see what part of the body you hit. And like I said before, the character sheet does a really good job of making it easy to see what is or how what your damage resistance is for a specific body part. So armor does follow a similar layout to what we found in the weapon section. First is the armor that you can get for your dog, if you got the dog beat perk. And yes, your dog does get to wear armor, which is actually really cool. Then we get a general list of all of the different armors, what damage resistance they bring right off the bat, their weight, how much it costs, um, what locations it can cover, and stuff like that. Just general information that you're going to need to know. The descriptions for all of these are just descriptions. Some of them do have abilities like the casual hat. A character wearing a casual hat ignores any difficulty increases caused by extremely bright light, but they're few and far in between. Then you're going to get a separate section for each, or, or at least mods. So Vault Jumpsuit is article of clothing, and by default, clothing can only have one uh, mod on it. So we'll of course have a breakdown of the different armor types. So Raider armor, leather armor, metal armor, combat armor, synth armor, and vault tech tech. Sorry, vault tech security armor. You're also going to get some mods that you can get for each of those different sets, which is actually pretty cool. It makes armor more unique and diverse, which is also really cool. And then you're gonna get some power armor, maybe if you find it. Just saying, I'm not going to give my players that option right off the bat. But there's actually quite a few number of power armors. There's actually five. And that's actually really surprising, or at least to me. There's actually Raider power armor, which I never knew was a thing. But I guess it's just like, you know, scrapped together power armor. 
you're gonna have the T45 power armor, the T51 armor, the T60 armor, the X01 power armor. And they all share, I believe, the same mods because they're all technically power armor, so you can actually use them, which is all right. I mean, power armor is pretty cool. And if you're a robot character, don't worry, you do get the option of modding yourself. So of course, since we're following equipment, you do get to use consumables. And <laughs> this is the ex this is how deep and far this book actually really goes. And I absolutely love this. If you've ever played on the highest difficulty of Fallout, you do have to keep track of food and hydration. And that's the same here. There's many, many options for food. There's like three pages. Unfortunately, the description is just fluff text, which is pretty amusing to read. You're going to have some beverages, not as many as food, but I can, I mean, that's all right. And same thing, it's fluff text, although some of them do have special effects. And then you have chems. So just like in any Fallout game, you do have some chems or drugs that are going to give you some sort of effect. And yes, there is addiction. So for addiction, what you're going to do, you're going to take the number of doses a character consumed that session and roll that many action dice. If the number of effects show or equals or exceeds that chem's addiction number on the chart, then they become addicted. And each of the chem descriptions has that addiction effect, which is a really good use of the description itself. So, for example, Fury. A failed addiction roll renders you addicted to Fury. You increase the difficulty of all strength and perception tests by plus one whenever you are not under the effects of Fury. So, yeah, addiction's uh, not so good. Books and magazines are another concept that are, you might be familiar with in the Fallout universe. These are one use time only unless you have a certain perk that does that. I believe it's called Comprehension that gives you the chance to use that book again for its effect but these are just like temporary buffs to whatever test or stat you're using it for i do like that they do provide descriptions for those magazines and the fact that the magazines themselves are titled with issues like man I know that there's a lot of lore and stuff in the Fallout universe, but they really went out of their way to name all the freaking magazines from Tesla Science Magazine. Will robots rule the world? What is plasma anyway? That is like so cool. Like that just gives the GM many, many more options to use. Now that's a good thing. And remember, that's also a bad thing if you don't like to plot things out or if you don't like a game with a lot of detail to it. And believe me, there are some people that are like that. And then of course you're gonna have your miscellaneous items. So it's gonna be like your backpacks, bobby pins, doctor bags, flashlights, and anything else you're going to need to go out adventuring. And yes, the pit boy is an item that you can get or find or steal from the hand of a corpse or a living person, I don't know. And of course, robots do have some modules that they can install within themselves. By the way, can I just point out, like, how cute is that picture? Mr. Handy walking the dogs there with a pink poodle that's chewing on their leash. That's just, man, this game is so full of flavor. Let's get on to survival. This is where the rest of the game's mechanics are located. If you've ever played the highest difficulty of New Vegas or Fallout 4, then you are going to remember things like thirst and hunger, like we found in the equipments uh, section or equipments chapter. Some of those mods for those games also add a sleep mechanic, and yes, we're going to have to worry about that too. Here you're going to find rules for all three of those. So, fatigue. Let's start with fatigue because hunger, thirst, and sleep encompass fatigue. Fatigue is something that you're going to get when you enter a starving state or a dehydrated state or an exhausted state. And it's pretty bad. So whenever you gain action points, you reduce the amount you would gain by one for each point of fatigue you have to a minimum of zero. That's pretty bad, especially if you have a lot of, if you plan on making use of those action points. In addition to that, 
Whenever you begin a scene with fatigue, you lose one HP for every two fatigue you have. This is not reduced by any form of damage resistance. Like, why would it be? It's armor. It protects the outside, not the inside. So, there's different states of hunger. So, when you're full, if you've, you're full if you've eaten your fill, you can't eat any more food while full. You're sated if you've eaten recently, but you've still got room for a bit more. You're peckish if you're ready for your next meal. And so it keeps kind of going down and down till, until you're hungry. And then the last part is starving. And you have similar effects for thirst and sleep. There are lots of diseases that you can get out there in the wasteland. And those are pretty bad too. So you might want to watch out. Don't get bitten by something. And then we're going to have rules on scavenging. Scavenging is a whole beast in and of itself. This is what you'll be doing to survive out in the wasteland quite a bit. You're gonna find weapons and armor, chems maybe hopefully, and other much needed supplies. And it is also here where things get really confusing. Now, there's a nice handy dandy explanation about scavenging right here on page 195. It says category level, scale, degree, items, and other details and stuff like that, but nowhere in this section or in this book do we really get like an example of what that really means and that's pretty bad like this is a whole new concept that i've never seen in any game and there's there's no examples or any how to's or anything of that nature it's it just tells you what this is and expects you to figure it out. And I actually really found that to be very confusing. I could understand if this was meant for a, to be a tool for GMs to use, but it really would have been nice if they had better examples than just the paragraph, you know. I really would have liked to see some samples that I can take and plug them into my world. Because the locations that are following in the next couple chapters, they don't even touch anything about scavenging. So, yeah. So what is here, you ask? Well, first, you're going to have to determine the degree to which this location has already been scavenged. Has it untouched, partly scavenged, mostly scavenged, or heavily searched? Okay. This determines the difficulty of the scavenge roll, which, by the way, is perception plus survival. So the difficulty is either going to be zero, one, two, or three successes that you'll need. And that's where you're going to stop going across. So yeah, this table is super uber confusing too, by the way. So degree is followed by difficulty. Then you're going to decide the scale. Is it a tiny location, a small location, an average location, or a large location? This is actually going to decide the time it takes. Do you see where I'm getting with this table? I can have an untouched difficulty zero, but with an average scale, which is going to take 30 minutes. So two of these follow the other, but not necessarily the third. It would have been nice if they had at least included a freaking line in between difficulty and scale to make note of that or actually just include these two concepts on a different table like really i mean you would just automatically assume that untouched meant zero difficulty which meant tiny which meant one minute which that might not necessarily be so uh that's just that's just lazy in my opinion that's totally bogus we have a location in mind and we decided the difficulty now we get to populate the location with inhabitants, I mean, obstacles and hazards. And for small locations, they're going to be between one to three inhabitants. An average location is going to have three to six and large is going to have five to ten inhabitants. So one of the really good things I will say about this section is you can either stealthily enter with agility plus sneak or you can just go in guns a blazing. Which mm, it depends on what you see. So the inhabitants come in five different varieties. Animals, feral ghouls, raiders, super mutants, and robots. I mean, that's kind of a given. And there's even different kinds of obstacles like mechanical locks, like electronic locks, or collapsed structure of some sort. Hazards are going to be detrimental to your health, so avoid them at any cost. 
Um, they only kind of separate them between ongoing and occasional hazards, which, I mean, I really wish they would have given more specifics on that. And then we get to the myriad of loot tables that are found here, which I am fine with because, I mean, this is straight up like what you would find in the Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition. Just loot tables galore. You want food? There it is. Cams? There it is. Weapons, melee weapons, pick your pick. It's all there. And then we get to crafting. Oh boy. Crafting. So, you remember in Fallout 4 when you would find different workbenches and stations? Yeah, all that's here too. And that's actually really cool. I made that sound like it was going to be a bad thing. I'm sorry about that. So you're going to have armor workbenches, chemistry stations, cooking stations, power armor stations, robot workbenches, weapon workbenches. Like, this is going to be every person's hideout, like creating crafting thing galore like if you like building structures and stuff or hideouts for your characters and this is going to be right up your alley so not only do you get like all these workbenches they there are nice tables that actually tell you what you can do with those or what you can make with those uh, workbenches and stations the only thing that i have that's a little bit of a complaint is that they introduce a new terminology here, which is a little bit confusing. You have complexity, and complexity is basically the materials that it takes to build that whatever it is. Like Ballistic Weave Mark II it takes three, which is common materials times four and uncommon materials times two. Although I will say complexity also does come into play in terms of a formula. So the difficulty to craft an item is going to be the complexity minus your rank in that skill. So if you're really good at like being an armor smith, then those, uh, those pieces that are not as complex are going to be easier. And remember, there are level zero tests, so you could automatically get those for free if you have the resources for them or generate some action points. And there's lots of things you can do with these different stations and it's really, really in depth. And that's, I think, the biggest takeaway from this game is it is so in depth and it's really cool. I mean, I'm just loving it. Like, But I can also see that some people really would not be into it. That's my gripe about scavenging. And that's actually really the last part about the mechanics of the game itself. So now we're actually going to get to one of my, my favorite types of sections, and that's going to be the lore. Starting with Corporations of Pre-War America. So like I said, this is the beginning of my favorite type of chapter, and that is lore. And I am not well versed in Fallout lore, so these next couple chapters were just a joy to read. Like, this is something that you would really find from the Fallout wiki, and uh, there's just so much information. And something that I really do enjoy about this is that there are quest seeds spread throughout this section just things to kind of get those ideas flowing so if you're going to this location this might happen and stuff like that and so this is really a history lesson of what it was like in the pre-war or during the pre-war and how it translates to after the war if you haven't figured it out by now uh, this setting is a post-apocalyptic of course and this is actually taking place in the Commonwealth, which is around the Washington, D.C. area. And so if you've played Fallout 4, this is it in our pen and paper RPG form. If you've played that game but were unaware of its lore, then this would be a really good chapter to read. And I really enjoyed this. The same with the next chapter, which is Vault Tech. So here we have another history lesson. There's a brief explanation of the history of Vault Tech and what happened October 23rd, 2077, which I can say is very different than what's happening in Night City. <laughs> but I digress. The best part of this chapter are all of the vaults that are in the Commonwealth, their history, what happened 
in the vault. And let me tell you, there's some pretty strange stuff going on in some of those vaults. If you've played Fallout, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The only thing that's really missing, and I, it's like such a shame that it's not even here, but it was in the last chapter, are quest starters. Like, if you had some quest starters for each of these vaults, this would have been so much better. Instead, we get like some room encounters and some wacky quest player characters and... That's kind of it. I guess you do get like plots, but I'd rather have like something quick to start or get those ideas flowing. But I digress. The end of the chapter does have some plot seeds and some side quests, but they're not really specific to any of the vaults, which is a shame. It's kind of a missed opportunity. So, oh well. And then we get into the Commonwealth. <laughs> If you haven't played Fallout 4 and you don't want spoilers, you'll probably want to skip this chapter, but like, really, I don't... If you've picked up this book, I'm assuming you're a fan of the Fallout universe, so you've probably already played that game as much as I have, which, actually, I don't think is that much. This is basically a brief summary of what happens in Fallout 4 without really diving in and telling you what the choices of the, uh, the, the Wanderer, Fault Dweller... I forgot their name already. They go by different names in like every game, so it's hard to keep up. And there are locations that are going to be very familiar if you've played that game. And they give a very detailed description. There are some quests for some of those locations as well, which is pretty good. I really do enjoy that. And there's just a ton and tons of locations. It's really cool. There really isn't a whole lot to say here. It's pretty much like the previous two chapters. It's just a lot of fluff text and lore. But it is a really such a good read. I would highly recommend reading through this section. And especially because it gets some of those ideas going. So at the end of this chapter, you're going to have some random encounters. And then you're going to have some weird encounters. So it's kind of equivalent to the weird wasteland perk from the games where... It just makes some bizarre things randomly happen. You don't need a perk for that, but there is a table for it in this game. And I would, of course, definitely add some more to this table just on your own because there's so much stuff that you could do with this. It's, it's really cool. Then we get to the chapter on game mastering. Every pen and paper RPG has to have one of these chapters, and Fallout is no exception. There's some explanation of some of the generic core rules. There's just more in-depth explanations, um, like complications, increasing the complication range for certain degrees of tests, uh, task difficulties, and raising the difficulty on tasks, and what you can do with your action points, which is Pretty much the same as the player's action points minus the ask yourself a question because that would just be kind of weird. There's some rules for opposed tests and then there's a section on safety and consent and it seems like every book has to have this section and I, I am very appreciative that Fallout does have this section because we're living in a day where in an age where a lot of us are not going into our local game store to play or rather, if you're like me, my local game store tends to only play Dungeons and Dragons. And it's so hard for me to find people locally that want to go outside of the norm, I guess, and play different games. So we look to Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds for our games. And you don't really know who you're going to play with. You don't know where they're coming for or if they have any triggers. And this is just... You know, a guide for game masters to kind of handle those situations. This section, the Fallout experience, I think this is in the wrong chapter. Like, this should have been way at the beginning of the introductions chapter. I'm just saying. Like, this is a perfect piece for anybody who hasn't played Fallout. This would have been perfect for them to read at the very beginning of the book. There's going to be some awesome tips on starting your own quests and campaigns. 
It's just such good information for game masters. Of course, if you've read any RPG book, it's all the same in just a different variety or degree of varieties and stuff like that. It's just, it's a good read. Then we get to the Denizens of the Wasteland. This is the monster manual of the Fallout universe. There are five categories of NPCs. Normal, Mighty, Legendary, Notable, and Major. This pretty much sums it all up. It decides how hard they're going to hit or how hard they're going to kill. It, it's just like that. There's also many different keywords for those NPCs like Human, Raider, Brotherhood, Ghoul, Super Mutant, Robot just another way of categorizing those NPCs. And something that I really do appreciate is the NPC reaction. So there's actually three different dispositions that an NPC can have towards you at the when you first meet them. So they can be an ally, an enemy, or a bystander, which is indifferent or neutral. The actual character sheet for these creatures are actually, they remind me a lot of fifth edition. It's got your stats that you need, and then the attacks and special abilities are at the bottom. And there's just a whole ton of different NPCs to use here. Like, think of a think of an enemy in Fallout 4, and it's here, plus some varieties. Like, it is so detailed and so cool. And I really do like its organization, like... Pretty much every NPC gets one page, usually. There are some exceptions, and it's very easy to read. Like, if you've ever played Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, this is a breeze to read. And there's so much variety. Like, there's so many different types of synths. You have a regular synth, which you will probably see out in the wasteland. You've got a synth courser, a synth strider, a synth trooper. I mean, I don't even remember fighting off against any of those in Fallout 4. So the level of detail and just the fact that they're adding some things here, which we'll talk about here at the end of this video, it's just so cool. Like, I keep going back to this, but this book is very detailed, and I am so glad of it because it really does give you a lot to play with, which is actually quite good. My one and only gripe with this section. How in the hell are there only one type of Zayden? I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm going to take off a star for that atrocity. I'll give back a star because of this cool magazine poster right here. I mean, it's $29. Look at that. Who pays $29 for a magazine? I actually do. <laughs> so let's get with a bang or a whimper. This is the introductory adventure for the game, done in three acts, and without giving it too much away, the premise of this adventure is player characters are going to solve uh, the murder of two of a ghoul, and the institute may or may not be involved, which turns into a big old who done it, or rather find the synth, figure out who's the synth, and eliminate them and. Is it's actually a really cool adventure when you read it and it goes through it does a pretty good job of hitting all the major points of the game with the exception of scavenging and this would have been the perfect place to have at least one example of what scavenging looks like and how to implement it such wasted opportunity but you do get more NPCs to play with here Although I'm pretty sure these are just the same ones from the previous chapter. But it, it's a really cool adventure. It would seem like it'd be very good for a one-shot. I mean, it is. It's not that big at all. Or very long at all. And then we get to the appendices. This is the final chapter, and it's reserved for the index, which is quite extensive, which it needs to be because the table of contents wasn't that extensive. <laughs> and you have the character sheet. But before we get to the character sheet, is the best artwork in the entire book, The New Cola Girl. 
I mean, just look at that. It looks so cool. And the character sheet, which if you've watched my previous video, you've probably seen this character sheet before because it's the same thing. And I'll just point out, it's very intuitive and it's very easy to read. And I'm so thankful that they actually separate the head and left arm, right arm the way that they do on the character sheet. It's just so cool. And of course, we get a please stand by. By the way, this is the back cover. You're special. You made it this far in the video and I bet you it's like an hour long. So kudos to you. Let's get into my final thoughts. There is a lot of content here. More than I expected to find in this 431 page book. I love just about everything about this and I am super excited to have this in my collection of my bookshelf that can't hold any more books until I get my new Ikea bookshelf, which is coming at the end of the month. There's so many things I can say, but I really don't want to keep this video going any longer. I do actually hope to play this, preferably with a group in town, but for reasons like I stated previously, it probably is not going to happen. So my own players are going to get to suffer through at least one quick adventure of this before we move on to the main Star Wars campaign that I have planned out next. However, there's a big missed opportunity. I can see why the setting is Fallout 4 and the Commonwealth. It's the most recent entry and people are probably most familiar with it. Although, let's be honest, it would have been really interesting if they had opted for Fallout 76. <laughs> I can see that there's a lot of room for expanding it to the other settings. Like how cool would it be to have a source book for New Vegas or whatever Fallout 3 was or even Fallout 76 like or even just like the first two Fallout games. Like how cool would it be to have those as a source book? Probably not going to happen by the way. The missed opportunity I feel is that they stuck with the material that is known. A part of me was really hoping for a new setting within the Fallout universe, but I can also see where Bethesda would have just basically pulled the plug on that. Like, they just would have said no. Because remember, Bethesda holds the licensing for Fallout, so basically Modiphius has to follow what Bethesda has done. And it's not like there isn't new content here because the Denizens introduces some variations of like the synths and stuff like that. So there is some variety and there are some new things. Would I recommend this game? Hell yeah. So long as you like Fallout. This was actually my first real introduction into the 2D20 system. Like I've glimpsed through the Star Trek one way long ago when it first came out, but I don't remember anything about that. And it does seem like a solid system, at least where Fallout is concerned. Would I play this? Also, yes, but I'm probably not going to use the Commonwealth. It just doesn't really speak to me as much as like New Vegas or my own setting. Like I actually already have an idea for what I'm going to introduce to my players. We're just, we're going to, we're going to go to Hawaii, basically. <laughs> So a quick note about the dice, they are not needed, but they really do help. There's a chart towards the beginning of the book that converts these action dice into regular D6s. So one is going to be one hit, a two is going to be two hits, three and four are going to be blanks, and five and six will be effects. I don't, I think there's a rollable table for um, body parts in there as well. But the dice really do kind of make things a little fun. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Rolling this body part die. So cool. Look, I just got a headshot. <laughs> but, I mean, this is the game in a nutshell. I'm super excited about it. And I hope you guys are too. Feel free to leave a comment down below. Give this video a huge thumbs up to support this series. And subscribe if you would like to see more. I will see you guys in the next video.